From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is doing his civic duty. D O O D Y. Oh, yeah, that is how it's spelled. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They call me Ben. We're joined with our guest producer, Max White Pants Williams. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. And Matt, I think it's fair to say this one has been a long time in coming for both of us. Yeah, you know, just about 20 years, roughly. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we're we're uh, we're hearkening back to some previous episodes uh, wherein you and I explore the concept of a think tank, you know, shout out Rand Corporation, right? The shadowy quasi governmental uh, nerd trust which we mean with great affection, like a think tank in general is just here in the U S it's an institution or a group of people organized around the study of a specific issue. And the idea is that if you are a world leader, you can look to these groups to get in-depth insight, advice, and analysis of anything under the sun. Like, let's be honest. It's true. Most members of Congress do not have time to become subject matter experts themselves on a number of issues. So they go to the experts in, say, meteorology or the experts in plastic production, literally any industry, name it. There's a think tank that applies. And I I don't know, maybe I'm being a little Pollyanna, but I would say in general, most think tanks are a huge benefit for the world. Like they're smart. They care. They know what's up. Yeah, but yeah, theoretically, you can have the greatest minds come together and f- figure out problems, right? Figure out solutions. Or a, maybe this way, figure out the best 30 solutions to a major problem and then discuss those solutions, each one as an individual thing, together for a long period of time. And then you can take those, you know, the best ideas and let's say lobby Congress or the president with those ideas to say, hey, we think we understand this problem better than maybe your joint chiefs of staff. Here's the here's what we think. Maybe mull it over for a bit. Funny you should mention that, Congressman, because a retired member of JSOC is, in fact, part of our think tank. And here's what he says. You exactly. Know? <laughs> exactly. And and if you are a think tank like that, that publishes your work on a regular basis, let's say you're just a member of one of those people that you'd want to be lobbying, right? Maybe you are just reading that information as opinion pieces, essentially, on a weekly, daily, even monthly basis. Uh, you There's this like, there's an influence that's occurring there with these think tanks, maybe whether even they know it or like to think about it or not Mm -hmm. agreed there's there's a tremendous deal of soft power inherent in these sorts of conversations and it reminds me also of our earlier episode on alec uh the american legislative exchange council like how uh think tanks often will craft uh, craft policy proposals, right? And the idea is when everything works out and is above board, the idea is that members of the political class and some private industries will read these policy recommendations and say, heck yeah, bud, 10, 10, no notes. Let's go do this list of 30 very specific things in this order. Uh, it's, unfortunately, for every 10 amazing in good faith to think tanks, uh, there are a couple of what the British would call the baddies, some incredibly yeah. shady things. Well, yeah. And, and, and I well, tell me what you think, Ben. I think the worst of it comes when there is a political action committee or something like that, that is directly tied to one of these think tanks to where money, money donations 
can be simultaneously given as well as suggestions for policy. Because that's when you get that thing that happens where policy is literally dictated or written down like a law is drafted uh, that then gets sent to somebody in Congress and they kind of just rubber stamp it or change a couple words to make sure it's theirs. And then it goes in and is submitted and voted on as a potential law. We, the private healthcare industry, are completely objective in our funding of this think tank that uh, has sent this policy proposal to uh, Congress folks on both sides of the aisle who are also the largest recipients of our uh, campaign donations. But yep. no harm, no foul. You know what I yeah. mean? Well, let's OK. So let's yeah. let, before before we even get into the bad stuff, let's talk about what. Every single think tank like this has access to that is public information about the United States specifically spending. So things like information about the GDP, the gross domestic product of the United States and where dollars get allocated for things. And well, I mean, it's for everything, right? Imagine anything the U.S. government spends money on. It's all in there except for the the part, the secret budget part. Shh. Because there is some of that Um, or the stuff that's missing from the (laughs) Pentagon's Pentagon's accounting, um, you know, to the tune of billions of dollars. But you you get things like the amount of overall defense spending that the United States uh, put allocates on a per year basis. Uh, So, Ben, I did I did a, a deep dive into GDP and defense spending and i wanted to really quickly just give some numbers out here so we can have maybe a starting place for the conversation Mm -hmm. is that okay yeah all right so in 1965 this is just the earliest back that macro trends had uh they went back to 1960 but i had to match it up with stuff from the dod's like official reporting So in 1965, the gross domestic product of the United States was seven hundred and forty three point seven billion dollars. That's all the money that everyone living in the United States, every company that is from the United States, all the taxes, all the other things all added up and subtracted seven hundred and forty three point seven billion. Not adjusted for inflation. Exactly. Or uh, depreciation Mm -hmm. or all these other things. But it's like it's the big number, right? Mm hmm. Of that money, uh, defense spending was 6.5%, so around $48.3 billion. Now, 1965, 6.5%. What we're going to be talking about a lot today is a group of people, a think tank that wants to make that number, that percentage of GDP that's spent on defense spending, increase that number just as much as you can increase it and just keep increasing it and always have it at a certain level, basically. And it's always a percentage. It's not like a dollar amount. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a proportion of Mm -hmm. GDP and it's, um, it's, an ongoing project in normalization of that percentage and moving the Overton window of what is acceptable to the American public. It's kind of, you know what we could call it? We could call it a group project for an American century. You know what I mean? It is like a group product project for that. It's just like that. Uh, we're all going to work together on it. But before we even launch into that, Ben, I want it because so that was 1965, just as like yes, a yeah, yeah, benchmark yeah, yeah. early, mm-hmm. right before the major time, I guess, that we're going to be focused on today, 1999, the year The Matrix was released, everybody. Uh, Shout the, out to Prince also. Exactly. Shout out to Prince. The GDP of the United States was was nine thousand six hundred and thirty one point one seven billion, right? So that's uh, that's like nine trillion. It's like uh, imaginary money at that point. Yes, but defense spending dropped down to two point seven percent overall. So nineteen sixty five six point five percent. 1999, 2.7%, which to a lot of the people we're going to be talking about, the individuals and the group, that is egregiously low of a proportion of your money spent on defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Eisenhower is dead. So he's not going to weigh in on that one. (laughs) But (laughs) you're right. There, there There is a problem. And this problem 
is this problem is apparent to all sides of the conversation. However, uh, it's kind of like, you know, if there are people who are on the opposite sides of the gun control debate in America, and they'll both stand up and they'll say, this is horrible. There's a huge problem. And as long as they don't get into the specifics of how they define the problem and what they think the problem is, then both sides feel very in sync and heated up about it. But uh, as you as you so beautifully set up, Matt, this is a story of what some would call a continuing uh, conspiracy, right? And perhaps to the critics, a quite successful conspiracy. This evening, we're talking about the project for a new American century. And buckle up, folks. It's kind of crazy. Just to be honest with you, here are the facts. Uh, Matt, do you want to do you want to talk about how how you ran into this? Well, I called a phone number Mm -hmm. the other day. Uh, It's for this thing called the project for the new American century. The phone number, I'm going to say it, 202-293-4983. Spoiler alert, the number you've dialed is not in service. Uh, (laughs) DC zip code or DC area code, obviously. It is. It is a DC area code. But that is a number that's listed on the publications from the year 2000 that were put out by the Project for the New American Century. Um, And it was it was something we came across because we've been I I will let me shout one person out really quickly. Lunch lady called in a while back and put us on to, I forget exactly what, what the topic was. I ended up getting mired in project for new American century because it was tangentially related. And I just went down a rabbit hole. Um, But we brought up another organization. It was something called the center for a new American security. And it sounded so familiar to me. Uh, That's what it was. Lunch lady told us about um, a documentary called, unknown killer robots that was on Netflix. And Mm. there was a person speaking in there who happened to be, uh, what was her name? Stacy Petty John. She happened to be from uh, this thing called the center for new American security. And I got fascinated by that, went down that rabbit hole, led to the project and reminded me of the September 11 attacks. But anyway, uh, we'll get to that. We'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, my side in another life, uh, the, activities of things like the PNAC were objects of intense scrutiny and study. You know, there are any number of universities, college programs, uh, kind of, a, what what would you call it? Feeder schools that study this sort of stuff extensively all with the intention of getting people into that industry and related sort of the world of policy and punditry, right? And so the PNAC, as weird as it may sound, uh, is a huge, huge deal in U.S. and indeed global history. Like you pointed out, Matt, it is no longer officially active. It was officially active for a very short amount of time in the course of less than one decade, though, uh, you could argue that it fundamentally shifted the actions of the United States and in doing so shifted the actions of the world entire. And the story, eh, I don't know, with these kind of origin stories, we could go back to the roots of Chicago neoconservatism. But the two guys who start this, the co-founders of the PNAC, are a guy named William Crystal and his buddy Robert Kagan. They are still alive. They are huge players in U.S. politics and policy. Uh, They also, the names get so vague and confusing. They also are instrumental in another think tank called the American Enterprise Institute. That thing is also still around. You can go to their website today. Uh, I'm sure they're super chill and a very fun hang. American Enterprise Institute. What do we say about vague names, man? I know. <laughs> I, mean, I hope you can take classes at that institute. I bet you can. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, um, sure, I'm sure they have plenty of... Actually, I can confirm. They have a lot of papers they want you to read. Uh, they have a, yeah. lot of, a lot of takes on things. 
Yes. Uh, by the way, if you are searching this up on your own, you probably won't find many references to William Crystal. Uh, he j- is generally known as Bill Crystal. Not to be confused with our pal from the uh, search for uh, Curly's Gold. Uh, I like that, Billy. Yeah, he's, um, a good, he's a good egg. Yeah. But this guy's been around for a very long time. Uh, highly intelligent when you listen to him speak. Uh, long time writer. Uh, he's considered, I don't know, one of the primary neoconservatives of our time, really. Um, he has been on television a whole lot. You've seen him be interviewed and just give speeches. Probably, if you, if you, again, if you look him up, um, you can find him. I don't know how much he's been on C-SPAN. I know there are other people that we'll be talking about today that show up on C-SPAN quite a bit. He's got a podcast. Um, that's that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's one of his primary means of communicating with the public at large. Uh, still writes extensively, as you said. Uh, still makes a lot of speeches. He is in the halls of power. He is in those inner circle conversations. Uh, he is probably most notable, aside from you know, like spots on CNN and mass media. He's most notable for being the former chief of staff to Vice President Dan Quayle, uh, who also, <laughs> did I tell you I read Dan's book? No, that I, that's great. <laughs> it's I, I still want to learn as much as I can about George Bush Sr. That Ooh. guy has been fascinating me more and more as, as time goes on. Oh, yeah. Uh, just the things that he got into and the, mm-hmm. the people he met. Mm-hmm. And decisions he made, holy mackerel. What a scamp, that guy. So Dan Quayle was vice president to George Bush, George H.W. Bush. Yes, Herbert Walker. Yeah. And, Former uh, head of the CIA, then yes. president. Yeah, because the CIA is definitely a thing people quit. Sure. Uh, so he's also uh, Dan Quayle, um, I guess, in the circus of p- political discourse uh dan quayle was notably famous for like a a dumb thing about how to spell potato which some of some of the older members of our audience may may remember (laughs) it's really simple it's the e that goes on when it's pluralized and then you'd remove the e but he did not and i'm gonna say again i think that was the the fact that that was a story uh showed us the future of political discourse, right? And yeah. and devolving it down into, you know, look at this guy. He gets fancy mustard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he can't spell one word on the fly because we all spell perfectly. <laughs> exactly, right. And, uh, and so this guy, for a long, long time, is bridging the gap from Ivy League ideology, conservative thought, very, very well-to-do uh, upper-class folks, to the political class. And along comes his buddy, Robert Kagan. Our buddy Rob is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution today. We know we're throwing a lot of names at you. Brookings Institution, other bag of badgers, maybe a different episode. But but like, like his pal Billy, he is a prominent foreign policy advisor. These guys are both sort of Kissinger light. And with Kagan, what's interesting is that throughout his storied career, uh, Congress folks, decision makers on both sides of America's political divide go to this guy. You know, they might not always agree with him, but they're like, hey, Rob, what do you think? Oh, yeah. Because his opinion matters. Oh, yeah. And there are are a bunch of other individuals we could get into, people like Gary Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-T-T. Tom Donnelly is one of the major authors that ends up publishing things that become very important to to this organization. Uh, But Robert Kagan and William, Bill Crystal, are definitely the primary guys. Um, And, oh boy, these two guys could be quite honestly, their own episodes, if you go into their background. And again, just like with George H.W. Bush, see where their influence has, where it's gone, and the people they've touched and the lives they've influenced. But we're not going to do that, right? Um, We're going to talk about an article they wrote together in 1996. Oh, yes. What a banger title. 
tepid consensus. Uh, this is their this is their diss track, basically, uh, toward the Clinton administration's foreign policy in the nineties. And what they're saying is, oh, I don't want to sound too hip hop about it, but what they're saying essentially is, you're a punk. Uh, all all the stuff that you have the United States doing is losing power and it is yep. losing influence and it is ultimately bad for the United States. Yeah. And fully dunking on that concept of spending 2.7 uh, yes. percent on GD of GDP on defense spending saying you're weakening us. Like we're not going to be able to fight the battles. All of our foreign allies are going to look down on us because we're going to be too weak to defend them when, you know, rubber me- meets the road. Um, Dunking is by the way, Matt, the perfect phrase. That's what I was looking for. That's awesome. Yes. W- which one? Dunking. They are. Oh yeah. They're dunking on the POTUS. Oh, that's it. That's definitely what's occurring here. Um, but and, but again, it's not just on. It's weird because in my mind, it's not just to talk crap about, you know, the sitting president that you don't agree with their views. It's about trying to get everybody else who's also a thinker in this space to feel and think in a similar way or to get their gears turning so that we it becomes more of a same page deal. Right. Right. Not just a problem, but a proposed solution. Exactly. Right. So we're not going to tell you, we're not just going to whinge and complain. We're also going to provide a path forward. And the argument uh, from, from these two individuals and their cohort has always been party takes a backseat to the good of the country. Asterisk. (laughs) <laughs> oh, we'll tell you about that asterisk later. It's down at the bottom of the page. Um, so <laughs> think about where the United States was at that time. If you go back in your history books, uh, we went through this whole thing during the Vietnam War. Remember that? That was the late 1960s, 1968. We spent 8.6% of GDP on defense spending. Then by the time we get to 1979, that had fallen to 45 But then we're seriously in this Cold War thing, right? So everybody like Bill Crystal, of like the Bill Crystals of that time came out and said, no, we got to spend more. Did, what about Cuba? What are you going to do about Cuba? You so haven't thought of that- Cuba. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> so that number in 1985 rose to 5.6% of GDP spent on defense. And now, again, we're in 1999, or like we're getting towards 1999, where we're lowering and lowering that number down to 4%, 3%, now 2.7%. Um, so that's the that's a state we find ourselves in. So everybody who is who has any kind of either, as you said, been ideological... Um, interest in having the United States as the most powerful military, the thing that cannot be stopped and will police the word world and should police the world. They are going to want that number to rise and they're going to argue that un- until they can't. Right. And there is, to be absolutely fair, there is validity to the concern. Right. Oh, there is. So, so it's, it, are there, multiple what we would call conflicts of interest of course remember these are regular yeah. people who have access to to pretty uh pretty significant funds as private individuals and they know where to put their money they know how to make the money dance but it's uh also it doesn't invalidate the idea that uh the world can be an ugly place and if you uh if you do not invest in this sort of force projection then the argument in a zero-sum game is that force shall be projected upon you so yeah exactly but but this is the thing that i keep trying to wrap my head around and i know it's it's proportional so ultimately that's what we're dealing with it's growing you know at a rate compared to another thing but the amount of money spent on defense in 1965 6.5 percent 48 billion dollars is dwarfed by the 2.7 per- percent spent in 1999 which equals 260 billion dollars so like just think about that from 48 to 260 billion dollars 
And the, and those numbers, those figures are adjusted so they equal the same amount, right? It's not like nineteen sixty five dollars versus uh, nineteen ninety nine dollars. It's all in uh, equivalent dollars for the year twenty twenty three. And each of those dollars could have gone to a school, a hospital, a library. I'm just not. I we can't not shout out Eisenhower. No, you're times. right, and it <laughs> could have. But I guess the idea is, even though we're only spending 2.7 percent in 1999, we are still spending so much money on defense. Like it's a, that's an insane number, 260 billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And at what point uh, can we still call it defense? Right. Like how much uh, force can one project uh, before you start to say "Eh, it's maybe a little proactive, maybe it's a little offense. (laughs) Well, let's well, we need to get further into it. But one of the primary things the Project for New American Century was writing about was griping about like DARPA projects and projects that were going through R&D. Right. For like the F-22. Is the F-22 worth it? What about these new versions of the howitzer cannons? We're spending a lot of money on that. And how much force projection is that actually going to give us? And you're just like, I can't wrap my head around all of that stuff. But they but they really are trying to identify projects to spend billions of dollars on that will last for decades and provide the most security. Um, Literally, in the case of missiles like the Hellfire, the most bang for your buck. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to pause here for a word from our sponsors. We'll be right back. And we have returned. Let, let's keep going. What did they say in 1996, 97? Oh, yeah. So uh, they, they published Tepid Consensus, their dunk slash diss track. And then a year later in 1997, they co-found the think tank Project for a New American Century. And what this does, really, it doesn't occur in a vacuum. What it does is it curates, uh, agglomerates a lot of thought and a lot of thought leaders that had been sort of shouting with their own separate microphones into into the world. And they have a mission statement uh, where wherein they say specifically, we want to, quote, set forth a new agenda for post-Cold War foreign and military policy that would ensure that the United States could claim the 21st century as its own. And they say U.S. military dominance not only protects U.S. national security and national interests, but it also establishes, and this is the scary part, a global Pax Americana, which is a very, a very fancy, like, land way for saying a peaceful world so long as the U.S. is in charge. Ooh, I've heard that phrase before, Pax Americana. I never knew what it was. It's a uh, you'll see like Pox insert empire here applied to so many things, right? Like, hey, we're Rome and everything's great so long as we're at the top, right? Is, th- is this the word we always throw around or we hear thrown around hegemony? No, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. hegemony, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, so uh, a world in which everybody checks with Uncle Sam first. Before they do things, just to make oh, control. Sure. Yes, yeah, control. Uh, an ultimate uh, suzerain, sovereignty, and it's an idea that's very old. It's as old as you know the first empires, right? Hammurabi is out there going, things are going to be great and super peaceful so long as you know my thing is king of the hill. Pax they- Hammurabi, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and so. There's also the Cold War thing, like you mentioned, Soviet Union. The world is transitioning at this point from a bipolar to superpower kind of situation to this more unilateral thing. Uh, the USSR is clearly on the way out by the 90s, and the boffins over a project for New American Century say, hey, let's run with it. Let's make the U.S the one global superpower judge jury and if need be executioner all the globe round and they were to their credit they were very honest about this they were not like trying to wrap stuff up necessarily in mystery at least not at the beginning they were like hey this is our thing this is what should happen let's do this and 
from 1997 to about 2006, they were super hard in the paint, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they 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 didn't stop. Uh, you can go, you can find the project for the New American Century's website through the way, I think it's the Wayback Machine, or it's mm-hmm. like, it's through archive.org. So we were able to go through that and find publications that have been wiped from the internet, but they exist fourth dimensionally in mm-hmm. the Wayback Machine. And uh, you can read about all of these things. Sometimes it's a tiny little memo that gets published that you can find there. Sometimes it's a huge document that is a culmination, like a um, kind of like a project of the project for the New American Century, right? Where they got a bunch of different thought leaders and ex-military people to come together and say, hey, identify a problem and give us the answer to it. And we're going to collate all of those different answers. And then we're going to write a summary, basically, of... Um, let's say a almost an outline of what the defense department should do to up its game and become powerful again. Yeah. 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 And their, their big hobby horse, we'll, we'll get to it in a sec, but just a teaser, their big hobby horse, of course, is Iraq. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> no, so, but that's yeah. important. Yeah. It, it's it, hugely important. <laughs> it was a, all about Iraq. For uh, and, years and years and years. But think about this. Hmm? Bill Crystal. Will Willie Billy Crystal. <laughs> I like Billy Will or Willie Bill. <laughs> Billy Will Crystal. He is working for Quail, who is working alongside George H.W. Bush, who invaded Iraq, right? In the Gulf yep. War. Mm-hmm. And it went really well. It was over swiftly, but it was like there was unfinished business there or something. Right? Oh, yeah. And all Bill Crystal and his pals want to do is get back into Iraq somehow and really punish them. They wanted to. Oh, OK. Yeah. I know. It's, it's Yeah, let's get into I it. I know it, yeah. it's, it's convoluted and it's strange, but it there isn't there is a fascination or perhaps an obsession with projecting power in the Middle East again. When you Myopic look at all so. the stuff together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is um, this is happening, you know, um, in in the wake of Iran Iraq wars, in the wake of stuff going down in Kuwait. Uh, the very aware of this, uh, their ideas, for the record, when they when they came out under the auspice of PNAC, these ideas are massively popular in conservative circles, and uh, for a lot of people who are hearing this, they are hearing stuff they had thought before. This is not new information to them. They're hearing it and it's like they're in church, you know, like, amen, tell them, pastor, let them know, a rock, we got to do something. And among the supporters of the PNAC are, uh, are some characters in our story, three Republican officials who were on a little bit of R&R, you know, Kind of biding their time, not a joke. joke. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're sitting out uh, and they're they're laying low uh, during the Democratic presidential administration of Bill Clinton, uh, Willie Bill Clinton. I don't know a lot of bills. Yep. Uh, uh, these three guys are. I am almost sure for every American, they will be names that you recognize. Fellow conspiracy realists, you might not know the whole score with them, but you definitely have heard these names before. So let's do them in this order. Okay. Paul Wolfowitz, which you may not remember unless you watched a whole bunch of political <laughs> television back in the day uh, or watch a bunch of documentaries. Mm-hmm. He's very important. Mm-hmm. Donald Rumsfeld, that mm-hmm. we remember for many reasons. Uh, but he was high up in the old defense uh, areas there. And then Dick Cheney, the vice president, uh, president, pr- vice president. Uh, okay. <laughs> Blurred lines indeed with that last one, right? Yeah. The, these names were commonplace in American and global media. And indeed, there was a time where if you turned on a television back when people still like cable, uh, you couldn't you couldn't go through three news channels without running into something about one of these guys, because they were very, very important in U S policy. Uh, they were also super duper huge fans of the project for new American century. And when the, the first thing 
that the PNAC publishes. It's like June 3rd, 1997. It's a statement of principles. And for everybody from Cheney on down, this is a stem to stern banger. This is like J. Cole's first album for them, you know? Oh, that indeed a banger. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, really good stuff. Not still, as much. Still big no, on Four Sills Drive. I still, I still really, I don't know. That one holds a special place in my heart. Agree. Uh, oh, that's a good one. Uh, but you know what? What? What are you going to do? Right? Like at first, if you are uh, the Clinton administration, then you might say, "Hey, these think tanks publish stuff all the time about any given, um, any given matter." But these guys are so connected that they are immediately taken seriously and they send like open letters to the Clinton administration and different um, conservative leaders of Congress. And they say from again, to, to their credit, they don't shift tone. They don't switch up their game. They say from day one, we got to get rid of Saddam Hussein. We got to do more stuff more proactively in the middle East. And if, People aren't going to help us, right? If our allies or coalition of the willing, if they're not down to clown, we'll do it ourselves unilaterally. We have to do this. We cannot depend on our previous partners from the Gulf War. Oh, yeah. Oh, they they were all about going in. They were about setting up missile defense all across Europe, all across all basically territories that would be considered allied areas. Um, and again, huge projects. And we're, if we're going to talk about defense spending, a major missile defense strategy that they wanted, that Robert Kagan was writing about uh, in the Washington Post as a part of PNAC, it would have cost hundreds of millions, no, billions. It would have cost billions of dollars to make that happen. And it would have put billions of dollars, it would have put millions of dollars in the pockets of individuals who were connected to those companies making like manufacturing all the things you would need right because if you're going to build let's just imagine an array of missiles on a coastline right it's not just the missiles and the thing the piece of machinery that fires that missile right it's the computer that tracks whatever the missile is being fired at it's the facilities for the human beings to be in that are monitoring and using those systems like there's so much construction money that also gets wrapped up in something like a missile defense program. Uh, but they're writing about that like crazy all the time. Uh, and again, it's all in defense of an enemy, some enemy. Oh, I guess we should say this, Ben. What, another primary thing there's writing about here is, okay, well, we no longer have a primary enemy in the Soviet Union. So now we are the hegemon. What do we do to maintain this status? Uh, how do we make sure there is not another enemy that can challenge us? Uh, and they do seem to target literally Al Qaeda or uh, Saddam Hussein, other powerful military leaders in uh, the Middle East as like people that we could go after. And basically that could stand in as our new Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just so uh, shout out to a, a little book. Uh, I've got it here somewhere called where to invade next that you and I talked yeah. about several years ago. And it lists, you know, not just Iraq, but also Syria, Iran, uh, Lebanon and Libya is another one. Yep. Uh, and, uh, well, because if you yeah. don't have an enemy, then why are you building on all those big guns, pal? Mm -hmm. Why, why do you, why are you making newer, more awesome F-22 fighter jets? Right. And it, and also, conversely, if one does not limit the growth of expansionist regimes, then they'll do what those regimes do. They will expand. So they could be uh, – the idea is – and it may sound a bit paranoid – but the idea is a regional threat today is a global threat tomorrow, right? So we're, we're preventing another USSR is the is the concept right let's let's make sure these things don't get the tlc they need in order to become a real world competitor another superpower and look the the players in this game in this pnac argument 
they're they're like chess pieces. They're moving around to assume different mission critical decision making positions. Of the like eighteen something people who signed these open letters, ten went on to serve in the Bush administration. Bush the second, George W. Bush. We know it's confusing, but uh, they they identified this real world case study. Right. They said, let's take it out of the realm of theory. Let's give people something actionable to do and let's make it a rock. The only question then that they had was how to justify this plan to like getting the conservative vote wasn't enough because America is a very big place. And there are a lot of people who are not conservatives. Right. They may even react on a tribal level to that. They might hate an idea just because of the person who is saying it instead of evaluating the validity of the concept, really what they needed is a reason. And just like how fascism always needs an external enemy, this reason could be anything at all. Let's take a pause here for a word from our sponsors. We'll be right back. And we're back. And in one of those big projects that we kind of mentioned before, the Project for New American Century got together with a whole bunch of people, including Donald Kagan, Gary Schmidt, who were the co-chairman of the project, and Thomas Donnelly, who was an author who ended up writing this big piece based on the writings of subject matter experts in the defense industry. It was titled Rebuilding America's Defenses. It was published in September of the year 2000, one year before a really big thing happened in history, uh, exactly one year. They put this thing together. It's huge. It's a massive document. You can find it right now on that Wayback Machine that we talked about. Um, it goes over the project for the, the new American century. Like again, all of the things we've talked about here, how it was established, who was a part of it, why it exists. And then it goes down. I think if you get to page 50, you get to section five and that is where it gets really, really interesting. The subtitle, or I guess the title of that section is creating tomorrow's dominant force. Hmm. And it's kind of a, it, I'm, to be honest, it's written really well, but it's kind of a difficult read because there are a lot of concepts that get thrown in, right? So you have to, if you're not used to reading words and sentences and uh, concepts about the defense industry, then it could be overwhelming, but I would highly recommend you check it out uh, because it is talking about increasing spending on military. It is talking about being able to fight at least two wars at once. One of the primary uh, subjects in here, Ben, is controlling both cyberspace and space. Yeah, space, space. Yeah, space actual. <laughs> and what they and what they're talking about is like we have to be the preeminent force in outer space. And if we are not, someone else will be. We need a space force. They are calling in the year two thousand for a space force. Which is something that was not established until what, late 20 teens or was mm -hmm. it like 2020? That's just crazy to me. There's also a uh, there's also a clear implication here uh, that they don't take the U.N., the United Nations seriously no. whatsoever. It's like our earlier episode about storming the Hague. That's very much their their vibe. You know, they, they're like, yeah, I guess there's some sort of treaty about space from the UN, but ugh, come on guys. Uh, we need, we need cyberspace. We need space actual. I love your phrase there, Matt. <laughs> and, and they also say, look, we have history on our side. We are in, we are the good guys here. We are correct in everything we're saying. And we are also pragmatic. We are realist. We argue that over time, there will be a slow shift toward our values. The U.S. is the world's police. Uh, it'll be a slow burn. And then they hit us with that, you know, that third act turn. They say, unless something happens. Unless well, there's yeah. a catalyzing event, I think they call it. Well, yeah, uh, they're they're talking about the thing we've already discussed. 
The United States is the big power. Right now, there's no equal on the planet. We have to do everything we can to keep that power. So we need an enemy to fight to show everyone that we are the big power. And I'm going to read from page 50. Quote, The United States simply cannot declare a strategic pause while experimenting with new technologies and operational concepts, nor can it choose to pursue a transformation strategy that would decouple American and allied interests. A transformation strategy that solely pursued capabilities for projecting force from the United States, for example, and sacrificed forward basing and presence would be at odds with larger American policy goals and would trouble American allies. What? Whatever. Nobody cares. I don't understand any of that. But page 51 starts like this. Further, the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. A year prior to the 9-11 attacks. Yeah, and that's the key phrase. They're saying, look, there will be a slow burn Big change takes time. You know, we admit that the Heinz 57 approach to foreign policy is the law of the land for now. However, and that's that third act they're going. And also, though, if something were to happen, then our timeline escalates massively. In other words, if there is a watershed moment, a triumph, a disaster that upends the usual bickering and bureaucracy of government, then let those ponies run. All bets are off. Well, because think about Pearl Harbor. It was the thing that got everybody on the same page. Oh, we need to fight. We have to fight. We let's get all the factories and let's build war machines because we we have to fight. Look what they did. Look Mm -hmm. what they did to us. Defense Authorization Acts go through. uh, Everybody puts their domestic differences to the side, largely. And uh, Congress becomes a rubber stamp. There is also very little in terms of oversight or interrogation of policies, right? So the U.S. wakes up in World War II, but also great injustices occur. Uh, A ton of people get locked up. Uh, Just because somewhere in their family, someone came from Japan, right? Great injustices, very few questions. And it's a troubling thing that occurs because this observation, like you pointed out, Matt, proves eerily prescient. Uh, The attacks on September 11th, 2001 occurred as if on cue. And I know that's a statement that might give people a sour taste in their mouths. Well, it, it, it certainly is. It seems that way uh, if you just look at it and you choose to view it that way, right? Most people, I think, choose to not look at it that way. And that is probably, you know, that's probably the standard. Like you, you just you look at it and you say, well, no, the September 11th attacks are a thing. This is just some papers that were written a year before, right? Mm-hmm. Um, right? And I think that's the way we also look at it. But we we have to at least... Imagine it because it is eerily, it's so eerie that this group of people wrote these statements, right? Curated this thing. Then many of them who were all on the same page end up in the White House at the time of the attacks that become the next Pearl Harbor. Dick Cheney is the most powerful vice president in U.S. history. Rumsfeld is secretary of defense. And our buddy Paul, the Wolfman Wolfowitz, is uh, the deputy of Rumsfeld. Over at the Pentagon, which is still to date, by the way, the world's largest office building. And they have beef with one guy that ends up in office, Colin Powell, because Mm -hmm. he's not a full team player. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a couple others, but Colin Powell is one of the big people that comes out after those attacks and is like, look, yellow cake, guys. It's yellow cake. They have it there. We got to go in. (laughs) And, And it's so we're getting I've been there's so much to cover here. This is a two parter. At, at the at minimum, uh, we're, we're setting this stuff up, and I love that you're pointing this out. The very next day, September 12th, 2001, Rum, you can read accounts of this, too. It's very like – it's like catch-22 level stuff, you know, where they're like, well, I guess we're going to start a war. And they're like, a war? Or they're like, a war against who? And like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. we got a meeting. But uh, Rumsfeld on September 12th says, we have to go to Iraq 
this should be a principal target of the first round of the war on terror. And so all of a sudden, as if by design, one might argue, not to be too Bader Meinhof about it, as if by design, uh, what started as a theory and ideology from Project for New American Century seemed well on its way to becoming real world policy. And every, like across the pond, European allies are incredibly upset about this. They're, they're saying the PNAC specifically is the architect of, quote, a secret blueprint for U.S. global domination. And that's why, wow. yeah, I know they're not mints of words. And this is, uh, this is a statement in multiple different outlets. It, that's the vibe of Europe. Uh, we also know there are other players in the game. And Matt, uh, here, perhaps we, we pause and we make this a two-parter because we just mentioned something that people, of, our, our fellow conspiracy realists have asked us about for more than a decade. September 11th and the aftermath. I'm kind of not looking forward to getting into it, but same, bro. Also, it's really important. So we're going to do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Here we go into the deep water. Uh, folks, we want to hear your take. Uh, as, as we mentioned, we will be back later this week with part two of the Project for New American Century. In the meantime, join us. We can't wait to hear from you. Find us on uh, YouTube, Instagram, uh, of course, on the PNAC uh, forum website, fan club, mm -hmm. big, big fans. Uh, and uh, and if, if that doesn't quite, uh, if that doesn't quite will your bills, you can give us a phone call as well. Yes, our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. When you call in, you've got three minutes. Give yourself a cool nickname and let us know in that message if we can use your name and message on the air. If you got more to send, maybe attachments, links, anything, anything, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.